Welcome to OPCC and happy Easter and welcome to those of you who are joining online. It's good to, good to see you all today. I was wondering, I, I see you back there, Nathan. <laughs> happy Easter, bro. Uh, and so it's good to see you all today. Uh, good to celebrate um, the Lord's resurrection. But the truth of the matter is, is we gather today and we've got all our plans um, laid out where we're headed for the rest of the day and celebrating with family um, the truth is, of the matter is that probably there's a teenage boy sobbing on his bed somewhere in the world today because his mother just died. And there's probably a girl huddled in a corner blocking out her parents who are screaming at each other. There's probably a seven-year-old somewhere feeling shame and secrecy as someone he trusted has sexually abused him, and he doesn't know what to do. There's a wife who is shattered because her husband has been unfaithful, and the husband feels like a complete failure and like he's lost his family. There's a man somewhere in the world today contemplating suicide because of a financial collapse in his life, and he feels ruined. And probably today, there is a mother in the Ukraine who is mourning the loss of both a father and a son. As we look at that, man, um, the world can be a very painful place to live in. And we think about all of these different types of wounds, because that's really what they are. There's no doubt that we've all experienced that pain. Now, some of you um, may not have. Some of you may be younger. Uh, I turned 52 this year. The longer you're alive, the greater the odds are that you're going to be hit with something and hit hard. And it's going to take the wind out of your sail. And it's going to wound you. And there are a lot of different causes for wounds. Sometimes our sin causes wounds. We step into something and we do something. We do something clearly that the Lord doesn't want us to do. And it causes a gaping, deep wound inside of us. Sometimes our foolishness does. Um, We just make a foolish decision. Sometimes it's the fallen world. You know, it could be a natural disaster of some sort that takes someone from us or causes our life to, uh, we lose the quality of our life. Some kind of natural thing that happens, a tornado, and a guy loses his leg. It causes wounds, or it takes the life of another person in your family. When we think about these different things, we recognize that some of these things are caused by other people. And some of these things are self-inflicted. And so, as we think about people gathered all over the world today, just like you guys are today, like more people go to church today than any other day of the year. The question is, why? Why? Well, some people are there because that's what you're supposed to do on Easter. You go to church. You go to mom's. You eat ham and you hunt eggs, right? That's just what you do on Easter. Some people are here, certainly, they want to celebrate the resurrection of Christ, but at this church, we'll be celebrating that next week, too. We celebrated it last week. That's what we do here. We celebrate the resurrection of Christ. So is that all there is to Christianity, to to faith, to Jesus? I mean, think about these people that I've described that we know We know that these situations, it's not a stretch for me to say that's probably happening in the world somewhere right now, even as we're gathered here. No one understands wounds like Jesus. Nobody. And the Apostle Peter, like he shows us that he's teaching us something very different out of 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. And, And I could, man, I could tell you, hey, I could come up here and teach on the the, the resurrection and do your typical Easter ser- Sunday sermon, but 
like I said, man, the resurrection's changed my life. So I talk about that all the time. And, and I, I really feel like the Lord has led me right here to this very place to teach you about something that has been really the most transformational thing that I know as a human being. And it's this. Peter says, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. And so the very purpose of Jesus is to bring healing to us. It's to encounter people in all these different types of situations. Sometimes the, the, heal, the, the wounds are very deep, like I described. Sometimes they're not as deep. They're, they, they're, they don't cut as deep, but they're still hurt. But the nature of Jesus is he's come to heal cracked souls because that's what we have. We are people that are together on the outside and messed up on the inside. And where we live in South Johnson County, I mean, like I, I, I lived and ministered in, in Oklahoma, a more rural area, a little more blue collar. Let me tell you the, one of the big differences between those folks and, and folks here. Folks here are a lot better about keeping it together on the outside when they're dying on the inside. Is they have the means to do it. You just self-medicate. Buy something new, go somewhere, do something, pour yourself into your whatever. Because it, if, when you're in a little more blue-collar area, it becomes a little bit more difficult to hide some of that. And, and people are a little more transparent and vulnerable. But people anywhere are the same. We're all the same. We, we're broken, and, and even, even though some may find it easier to be a little more transparent, the fact of the matter is, is that we all like to try to hide. And we like to try to put off this thing that we're together, like, but on the inside we're, we're crushed. And some of you walked in here today like that. Nobody even knows. People in your own family don't know. Your husband doesn't know. Your wife doesn't know. Your kids don't know. Maybe your parents don't know. And you just, like, are crushed in a mess on the inside, and everybody thinks that you're all right. Well, I want to have good news for you today, because that's what Easter is about. There is hope for the hurting, and in the midst of that pain that you're experiencing, there is power in it. There's an incredible amount of power in the pain that we have. And God's greatest desire, the creator of the universe's greatest desire, is to heal our brokenness and show us how to live. And the world is so messed up because people don't know how to live. They're pursuing all of these other things that really are just a way to self-medicate instead of pursuing the creator of the universe who ultimately will show us how to live. Now this verse, when it talks about healing, the Greek word behind it is the, the word eomai. And it means to make whole. And so God takes something through Jesus, he, he comes, God comes in the form of Jesus, he walks on the planet in the flesh, fully God, fully man, and it says by his wounds that he took on, he will make us whole. He will do a work in us to bring about completeness. And so that's, that's what we're going to learn about. Over the next few weeks, I'm just going to dive into that and unpack that in this series. How do we heal from the brokenness that we possess. Now, the apostle Peter, he's the one that wrote this. So he knew Jesus well, was in the inner circle, one of the, the big three, if you will, of the apostles, was the probably most dominant leader, not dominant in a negative way, but in a positive way. That he had leadership traits, and the Lord just raised him up and chose him and used him early on in the church to um, set the, the church to move forward. And he is the one that's writing this stuff to us about Jesus, who was a friend of his, who he says was God in the flesh. And he says to us that by the wounds that Jesus received, that we are healed. And he has a right to do that because he understood pain. Now, before I get into talking about Peter anymore, just listen to what he says in verse 20 of the same chapter that, uh, of the previous verse. He says, if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. And so Peter understood pain. And he's saying that 
listen, I understand pain. I know how pain works because I too have failed miserably in my life, even though I was a firm believer and very close to Jesus. As a matter of fact, if we look at Peter's case, what he did was he was so filled with faith in who Jesus was that um, Jesus said that he was about to go and die, and Peter says, never, Lord. That's not going to happen. And, and Jesus says, bro, not only is it going to happen, you're going to deny that you even know me. No. And before the rooster crowed on that evening, Peter denied that he knew Jesus three times. And you want to talk about failure, this is miserable failure to say that you would never do something and then just within a few hours that you actually do it, you don't do it once, you don't do it twice, you do it three times, and then in one of the gospel accounts it says that Jesus looked right into the eyes of Peter when he did it the third time. Well, that's bad enough. Then you run off. You're not even there. The next day, your best friend is crucified, whom you believe was the Messiah, and you were in hiding somewhere. And then three days later, Jesus rises from the dead, and you see him. You're one of the guys who found the empty tomb. And it's so like, that's exciting and all, but wait until, like, Jesus didn't stay with them the whole time. He would make these appearances over a 40-day period, so he would come and go, and there was these times when Peter was alone by himself and had to be scratching his head going, how could I have denied him? And he's living with that failure. He's living with a self-inflicted wound. And so he's telling us in this passage that he understands pain, and he's saying to us, the way that you get through that pain is you follow in the steps of Christ. We have reduced Christianity to America, in America, to coming to church a few times a year. That is not what it means to be a Christian. That is not what it means at all. What it means to be a Christian is that you have been transformed by the power of Christ and you follow in his steps. And as we follow in his steps, then he helps us to become all that we are supposed to be. He takes that which is broken and he brings wholeness to it and he leads us along in a journey step by step as we follow close behind him. There are so many people in the world today, there are so many people in the church today who don't know how to heal from pain. What we, what we do in our culture is we stuff pain. And one of the easiest places to stuff pain is when you are walking with the Lord and then you fail and all the people that you've been walking with the Lord around, you keep it together around them and you just start burying and pushing down what you're walking through. Instead of, you really don't walk through it, you just hide it. And so one of the easiest places to hide your pain and let it eat your lunch is inside the context of the church and ministry. That's not the only place it happens. It happens everywhere. It happens. It's just the American way. Be tough. Be strong. You've got to deal with yourself. You better go for yours because I'm going to get mine. That's the attitude of, of an American. Is that we have to be strong. No matter, nothing can take us down. And so we are conditioned to process through pain in a very harmful way to us. And so we bury the pain instead of becoming whole. And so Peter's saying, man, like, I know that because that's what I did. And now fortunately, Jesus came to Peter and he walked him through that moment. And, and he called Peter to follow after him and do exactly what, Peter, you're supposed to do. Don't worry about what the people around you are doing. You do what I want you to do. You listen to me. You follow me. And I have a journey set out for you. And what, what difference does it make what I asked John to do? This is your, your journey right here. And, 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 and the Lord works him through that failure that he had. And so Peter is saying to us, I have good news. Jesus shows us how to heal. 
I think that's what Easter is about, is that the, all of the brokenness from the different painful experiences that we walk in life, the Lord Jesus Christ, as we follow in his steps, he will show us how to heal from that brokenness. In verse 22 of the same chapter, Peter says, he committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth, and when they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. What do we learn from that? What is Peter saying? He's saying to us, Jesus did the right thing no matter what was done to him. Jesus didn't bury the pain. He just walked through it in the right way. Jesus, listen to me. Jesus suffered through the dysfunction of others and didn't allow himself to become dysfunctional. They mocked him. They beat him. They spit in his face. He is the God-man. He doesn't ever retaliate. He suffered, and why does he do it? He does it in order that through his wounds... And as he walks through the dysfunction of everyone else, he is able to help those he claims as his own do the same thing. This is why in the Gospels, in the, good, the Sermon on the Mount, we have all of these absurd statements like, if you, someone slaps you in the face, turn your cheek and let them slap the other side. What? If your right arm causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. Now, I'm not going to ask you if you sin today. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. Um, but it, if you were literally fulfilling that, you wouldn't have a hand to raise. <laughs> right? We'd be whacking them things off, going around with a bloody stump. That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying he's pointing out very clearly where we are as, a, as human beings. And he's saying that you need a transformation that is beyond what you are capable of doing in your own power. And I have come that you might have life and have it to the fullest. And when you lose your life, you will find it in me. And you take up your cross and follow in my steps. And I will give you the power that when someone does slap you in the face, your first response is not to slap them back, but to turn the other cheek. That when your right hand does cause you to sin... You look at it and you go, I don't want to do that anymore. I'd rather not have an arm than to continue to do that. And you start resisting the things that take away from your life because you're now following in the steps of the Messiah who is the God-man and living in you and enabling you to do things that you didn't even know you were capable of doing and you could not do without him. You don't start loving your enemies just because Jesus said to. <laughs> you can fake it, but you'll never make it. You can't love an enemy, but you see these stories. You see these stories of someone's son being murdered and the people on TV, you know, some of them are saying, oh, I want justice, I want justice, I want justice. And I get that, man. I would, it would blow me away. I mean, it also blows me away when I see these other people and they're like, we've forgiven them. How? And the, uh, the reporter's like, how? And they begin to express their faith in the Lord. It's, it's, not, it's not humanly possible without the Lord. And that's what Jesus is saying is that, man, I will come into your brokenness, into the mess, into the, everything that is broken and fallen about you, and I will complete you. I will make you whole, and I will help you become something you could never do in your own power and strength. And sadly, we don't know how to do that. We don't know how to walk in the dysfunction of other people without becoming dysfunctional. And so when we become dysfunctional, the thief steals, kills, and destroys the very life that Jesus died to give us. And that's what Easter's about. Easter's not about going to church and on one Sunday and just celebrating the resurrection. Like Easter is about transformation of the soul, changing people from being dead in their sin and trespasses to alive in Christ. And then we're no longer walking and responding dysfunctionally to dysfunctional situations. And people that are dysfunctional see us not responding in dysfunctional ways, and they're scratching their heads and saying, what is, why does this person live this way? 
And how has this person seemed to be so content with life? That's what Peter's saying. He's saying, men, Jesus shows us how to do that. But not only does Peter teach us that, he's pe- teaching us that pain is productive. So many of you walked in here, man, and, and you feel like, geez, how did he know? How did the pastor know I was hurting so bad today? I didn't. I've just been there before, right? It's part of life. Pain is just part of life. And, and so the good news for you today, this is what I know about pain. This is what Peter teaches us about pain, is that it is productive. Now, that can be good news and bad news. Let me show you what I mean. He says of Jesus, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. This is verse 24 where I started. So that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Now, no one wants to experience pain. You know, hey, I've got a little pain here for you. You want some of this pain? Boom, sign me up. That's not what we do. We want, as a matter of fact, we do everything that we can to avoid it. That's why we bury it. As we think that it'll go away. It's down in there, man. You might bury it, but it's still there. And it will decay and get uglier and nastier and eventually make your life stink. Because pain is productive. It always produces. We have to understand that regardless of whether we walk through it in a healthy way or an unhealthy way, it will produce in our lives. Unhealthy pain produces death. Healthy pain always leads to resurrection. That's why Jesus was wounded. That's why he was pierced for our transgressions. He did it in a healthy way. And because of him walking in a healthy way, when we process pain correctly, we see from Jesus' model, we experience growth, death, and life. When we process it incorrectly, as we are so prone to do, We experience dysfunction, separation, and death every time. And so pain will hit us all. It will hit us when, and here's let me tell you, one of the things that's so painful about pain is it hits you out of nowhere. Everything's going along just fine in life, man. Boom, everything's fine. All of a sudden, man, your wife is hit and T-boned in a car accident and she's gone. That's pain. You're focused on the re- remodel in the home, and you're finishing this, and you're, you and your husband are so fired up about remodeling the kitchen, and you've got these cabinets ordered, and you're doing all this stuff, and all of a sudden he feels a little bad and finds out he has cancer. That's pain. It comes out of nowhere. You're moving along, you think everything's going great in your marriage, and all of a sudden you find out your spouse is unfaithful. That's pain. And you have one of two choices. You either walk through it and process it in a healthy way and allow it to bring life into you, or you walk through it in a dysfunctional way, and it causes death all around you. And so over the next few weeks, man, what I'm going to seek to try to teach you is how to learn and process pain in a healthy way. Because the same God that created the muscles that we use to walk created the souls that make us who we are. And as a muscle, when it is torn down, it grows back stronger. A soul is the same way. If it is healthy, it will grow back stronger. If a muscle is torn down and it is never allowed to start being used again, it develops atrophy. And a soul does the same thing. It becomes complacent with life. It becomes empty. It doesn't care anymore. That's why there's so much addiction in the world as people have come to a place where they just can't deal with life anymore. And they're looking for some kind of escape. And so like, we look around and we go, man, There is a way for us to process through this pain, and this pain can produce something in our lives. And Peter goes on to teach us in verse 25 that life works best when Jesus is Lord. That's kind of where I'm heading in the whole um, sermon today is that, man, life works when Jesus is Lord. Life doesn't work when you go to church on Easter. 
Life doesn't work when you just go to church on Christmas. Life doesn't work when you just go to church. Life works when Jesus is Lord. That's when Christianity works. Otherwise, you're a believer and you're in this really miserable place because you believe something that is true and you're not living it. And so you're just causing misery in your life. Peter tells us, as we land this thing, he says, For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. The word overseer is the Greek word episkopos. It means guardianship, oversight, inspection, one charged with the duty of seeing that things be done by others be done rightly. The overseer of the soul, he is in charge with the duty of making sure that what I do is done rightly. And so as I walk in his steps, he puts me back together in such a way that I am whole and life starts working in ways that I didn't even know that it would work. And the result is an incredible joy that comes from the Holy Spirit. Life only works the way it was designed to work when we are being human instead of playing God. It's the only time it works. And the way that we become human and let God be God is by getting smaller. <laughs> we ascend by descending. Everything in the kingdom is this way. It always is. We we get, it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. That's what Jesus says. He says these all kinds of things like this. And it's always that way in the kingdom. And so in order to like get through a situation when someone has wronged you severely, and people will wrong you. Like it will happen in this world. And it just because you follow Jesus, don't you think for one second that people will not wrong you. As a matter of fact, sometimes they will even wrong you worse. And as we walk in that, man, our temptation is, is, all right, you may do it one time, but you're not getting a second chance. I'm going to write you off. I'm done with you. Some of you, have, uh, you don't have any relationship with your parents because your parents were just totally dysfunctional when you were growing up, and they did something that you have never forgiven them for, and so you just wrote them off, and you said, they don't deserve to have a relationship with me. That's dysfunction responding to dysfunction with dysfunction. It's death. And so you think, man, I'll show them. You're not showing anybody. You're not showing anybody. You're just destroying yourself. There's got to be a time where you reach down and you let the Lord be Lord of that. And you realize that Jesus said, man, if you want to, you'll be forgiven by the way that you forgive others. And so if we think that we have a right to hold on to something like, like that and say, well, you don't have a right to tell me um, who I should and should not forgive, and I would say you are exactly right, but Jesus does. He's got a right to tell you everyone you should forgive because he forgave you against everything you did to him. And, he, and, and why does Jesus want you to forgive? Does he ask us to do these things? Is the Lord the creator of the universe? And we say, well, you need to follow God. Because if you don't follow God, then God is going to be happy, unhappy. If God is God, you can do nothing to make him happier. You can make, do nothing to make him more valuable. You can do nothing to make him more divine than he already is. And so he's telling you this truth because he wants you to be more divine than you are. He wants to pour out his power and pleasure into your life. And so as we look at it, that Jesus came and by his wounds we are healed. He took on the wounds and the transgressions and he did it with all of this dysfunction happening around him. And he willingly went to the cross for pleasure of being able to pour into you the things that he can pour into you. But as long as you are prideful and say, no. I don't care what God says in his word. Then you will never experience the life that he offers. You see, we have to bow the knee to Christ if we want to experience that life. Not my will, but thine. 
Whatever you ask me to do, Lord, my yes is already there. Here it is. And, and that's the big idea of today's message is that Jesus wants to be the overseer of your soul. That's what he wants to do. He wants to oversee your soul. He wants to guard it. He wants to protect it. He wants to see that what you are doing is done rightly, not for his sake, for your sake, because you're his sheep and you are precious to him. And he wants to give you life, life in abundance. And so, like, like, you don't start to think, well, you, ah, Sunday, I got to go to church. I love going to church, man. You say, well, well, you're a preacher, you love it. No, I became a preacher because I started loving going to church. And the Lord just called me into it, man. He just, I'm just following it in his steps, and he's just doing his thing. And so, like, man, I love church because the church is the body of Christ, and I love to be around people who know how to allow Jesus to be the overseer of their souls. And the more of us that are around Jesus and allowing Jesus to be the overseer of our souls, the more joy that will come to the planet and the healthier the, the, the country will get and the more we will experience in life as Jesus brings about transformation of individuals. Now, so this is week one of hope. When you were broken and you have some kind of pain, and no doubt some of you have. You walked in here with it. I just know you did. Is the Lord impressed upon my heart to teach this stuff. And you walked in here with pain. All you have is hope. When you have that kind of pain, that's all you have. I want to teach you a prayer. It's out of Romans chapter 15, 13. Paul says this. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. So that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I personally have experienced deep pain in my life two times. And when I say deep pain, I mean I was laying in the floor in a fetal position, weeping, broken, dark days. The first time was because of someone else's inflicting pain on me. The second time was self-inflicted. In those dark days, hope was all I had. Hope in Jesus. It was enough. It was enough. I wondered at times, Lord, will it ever be like that again? Lord, will I ever have this? <laughs> Wasn't it? It's better. He far exceedingly above, beyond anything that I could ever expect or think. And so here's what you need to know. That doesn't happen like in a day. That doesn't happen in a week. That doesn't happen in a year. It takes time. And I, uh, I look back on it, and uh, boy, I, I, I don't want everyone. I don't want to even get anywhere close to that kind of pain again. I know I'm not immune from it. Uh, 
I wouldn't wish it on anybody. <laughs> but I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. Because of what it has created in me. The intimacy that I have with the Lord. Um, the ability that I have to help others. <laughs> like I look back at it and I read this verse, man, and... Like, I've lived this. May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace as you trust in him. So that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I'm overflowing. And I want you to overflow. I'm not looking to build a big church full of people. I'm looking to help people be full of the Lord. I want to see you overflow. And when you overflow, man, people are going to see your life is not dysfunctional. And they're going to want to know more. And the church is going to grow. And we're going to come together on Sundays and we're going to celebrate. And we're going to see the Lord do a work, man, a revival. As people become people, not that go to church, but that follow in the steps of Jesus. Now when he says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. Those of you who are in your pain right now, like you're in it right now. Here's what that word peace, it comes from the Greek word Irene. And it means the tranquil state of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ and so fearing nothing from God and content with its earthly lot of whatsoever that is. Irene. When Jesus becomes the over seer of your soul. Irene is yours. And the joy will fill you. And you not only will have hope, you will start to overflow with hope. And so the gospel, that's why we call it good news. It's good news, man. And that's what Easter is about. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. Like the Holy Spirit is so thick in this room right now. Like God is here. Now I'm not, like here's the deal, man, is, Following Jesus is not about this one singular decision and getting baptized. Following Jesus is about giving your life to Jesus and following him. And so maybe today is the beginning of that journey for you. Maybe it's a repentance and a return to that journey. Maybe it's just a day where you say, Lord, I know you're the overseer of my soul, and I need to let you oversee. Because right now I've been overseeing myself. And it's not working. And maybe you need to confess Jesus as Lord. Maybe for you to the big decision today is shooting an email or a connection card and saying, I want to have lunch. I need to know more. But here's what I know. Like, I, if the Lord is at work in your life, like if the Lord is, is speaking to you, you raising your hand or coming up here to the front, that's not going to make any difference. What's going to make a difference is you saying yes to Jesus, and you know that he's calling you right now. You know that he is calling you to be one of his kids. He's inviting you into the kingdom, and you either say yes or no to that. You either say, yes, Jesus is Lord. No, he's not. Or you either say yes, and that you, you confess to him that you've not let him be overseer, and you just repent and, and pray and talk to him, and you start your journey, man, and you come along with me. Don't, don't listen to the devil who would tell you, you have so far to go. <laughs> 
It's always one step away from Jesus. It's just usually turning away from yourself and toward him. So it feels a long ways. But it's always one step. And so don't believe that you got a long way to go. We're all on this journey together. And that's what OPCC is about. It's helping you on that journey. So I'm going to pray over you. If you made a decision, I hope you'll share it with me. You can share it by putting the connection card in the, in the plate in the back. Give it to me on your way out. Email me. My email is on the back of the, the worship folder. I, I want to know. I want to connect with you. And I want to invite you to be a part of this family. Because Jesus is going to do something big here. And that's why you came to this church today. Heavenly Father, I thank you for these people. I thank you, Lord, that you show us how to heal. Thank you for hope. And for those that are here today, Lord, that that's all they have right now because they're walking in pain. Would you just pour your spirit out on them in a special way? Let this truth be a love letter specifically for them today. And those of us, Lord, who are not walking in that kind of pain right now, prepare us for when it, when it happens. Like, and help us, Lord, to recognize there are people all around us who are walking in that kind of pain. And help us come up close to them and help them see you. Jesus, you changed everything when you rose from the dead. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us this Easter. Let you do what you do best, and that is change us. We love you, we thank you, and we pray these things in Christ's name.